Hey friends, Todd here, doing a little prophetic pondering about the craziness of the days in which we live and the nearness of the return of Christ for the rapture of the church. And today, Christmas Eve, doing um, quite a bit of pondering, especially over the last couple of weeks, just about Christmas and the meaning of it, the significance of it. And um, I've been doing some studying and have some things that I think are really super cool that I wanna share that I think are a little bit off the beaten path um, in terms of the Christmas story. Um, still part of the Christmas story, but just some things that um, I'm gonna bet if you watch this to the end, you're gonna um, find something that you didn't know. And some of it uh, pretty fascinating, pretty cool. Some of it related to prophecy um, in some pretty startling ways, I think. Um, and others are just kind of some nuggets that we don't typically know, just digging a little bit deeper. So uh, I do, uh, you know, I, I acknowledge here that it's been a little bit since I've been with you guys. Um, I've actually been sick. Uh, I got sick about a week, a little over a week ago, and um, didn't know what was going on with me for the longest time. And it was um, very frustrating because the, the symptoms... Um, just wiped me out. I had um, f fatigue uh, to the nth degree was kind of one of the main things. But, you know, I, I tested for all sorts of things and I um, they thought it was this, it wasn't this. And um, it wasn't until yesterday that I uh, finally got some answers. And a couple of days ago, I finally kind of turned the corner and started feeling good. But it, it took me out pretty hard. So um, the good news is I'm uh, I'm getting healthy and I'm kind of back on bounce. feel like I've got a bounce back going. I'm probably, I don't know, maybe 95% today. So I'll take that a uh, day ahead of Christmas. So anyway, uh, but in that time, uh, I, I wanted to bring something to you guys in advance of Christmas um, relative to Christmas, but just haven't had the energy to do so. So uh, I've got that today, and even though it's Christmas Eve and there's some stuff I need to be getting done uh, ahead of tomorrow, I do uh, I do just feel like the Lord's put it on my heart to share this with you guys, so I, I want to do that. And I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible. Really, I, I thought initially this was going to be two videos, and I'm going to just kind of try to condense it as best I can and hit the highlights and not spend too long where otherwise I could drill down and just invite you in, on some things that I touch on that just to, to open the Bible, man, and um, and dig in for yourself. And, and and I think you'll be surprised where some of this study can go. But before I do anything else, uh, man, it's Christmas and it's a celebration of Jesus coming into the world. So I want to do a couple of things relative to that. Um, I, I think, see, here's here's the thing. Um, I think a lot of times at Christmas, we can kind of be guilty of kind of viewing, you know, sweet baby Jesus in the manger. And for a lot of people, that's kind of where he stays. And the problem with that is that's not why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come so that he could look good on a Christmas card. And, um, you know, he came not for the manger, but for the cross. And that that is really what the heart of Christmas is about. The heart of Christmas, the story of Christmas God entering the world is the story of the gospel. It's the gospel. It's it's a rescue mission is what Christmas really is. Um, God sending Jesus to rescue that which was lost, which was you and me. And he does that not by what happens at his birth, by instead what happens at his death. And so let me break that down to you if you've never heard that sort of thing before as part of the Christmas narrative. I always pray that someone watches these videos that has never even entered a church that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, that's never believed in him. Because I hope that you would give me just another couple of minutes to explain how you can and, and why it's important and how you can take the gift that Jesus came to offer you and make it your own. And and the, the word gospel, I know, is a churchy sounding kind of word. I get that. Uh, but it's simply a word that means good news. And Jesus came to bring good news. We know that as part of the Christmas story, right? But the good news is ultimately not that, again, not that he was born, but that he came so that he might save people from their sins. And we see the gospel throughout the Old Testament and prophecy. We see it throughout the New Testament as well. Uh, as being revealed and as being centered upon Jesus. That, that is who the good news comes through and who it really is. And we see the gospel summed up 
really well in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 2 through 4, say that this is the gospel or the good news by which you are saved, that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture and was buried and raised to life on the third day according to Scripture. And what that tells us is there's good news, and that's great that there's, there's good news, but it tells us that it's the good news that saves us which tells you that it's there's not other good news that saves you, but that this is the good news that saves you. That tells you also that you and I need saving. And so that should be, at least cause you to raise an eyebrow, scratch your head, and like, well, why do I need saved? To best answer that, I'm going to unpack that for you in kind of an ABC format, just to help kind of remember it. So the A being admitting you're a sinner. And I know that kind of, that'll turn some people off right away. But the Bible is really clear about it. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, and so all there is everybody. It's not um, some nuanced kind of Greek word where, oh, it really means this. No, it means everybody. It's you. It's me. It's the best of us. It's the worst of us. It's your pastor and your grandma, and it's the criminal, you know, locked up in prison. So it's everyone. Everyone has sinned. And so sin, the problem is, sin carries with it a consequence. The consequence is not just that we fall short of the glory of God, but in Romans 6, 23, it says this, the wages of sin is death. And so, look, and a wage is something that you're given because of what you've done, right? You get a wage because you've earned it from working. <laughs> Well, the wage that you're given, that you've earned because of sin, is death. And that death is not merely in the here and now. It's speaking of an eternal death. And we know that by how that verse ends up. It starts by saying the wages of sin is death, but it concludes by saying, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And man, there are some wonderful contrasts right there. Um, there's a contrast between uh, a wage and a gift, right? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, right? See, so it's the gift of God. It's offered as a gift. Or a wage you work for and you earn, a gift only needs to be received. And it's, so the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Okay, so that's a, eternal life contrasted to death, meaning the death is also eternal. How that comes about and how you make that your own is revealed in the, at the end of that verse. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And it's through believing in Jesus that you make that gift your own, that you receive it. So, sorry. And I hit up a little tea. Throat's already getting dry. That's not a good sign. Um, so believing in Jesus is the B. If the A, admit you're a sinner, the B, believe in Jesus. And but the, the most well-known verse of scripture talks about the importance of belief and how critical it is to your salvation. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, or his one and only son, depending on your translation, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish or die, but have eternal life. That eternal life comes through Jesus and it comes through belief in him. He doesn't force the gift on anyone, but it has to be opened and received by belief. Believing that Jesus was who he said he was. I say that frequently, that, you know, believing in Jesus was who he said he was is, is critical. And Jesus said so himself. If you look at John chapter 8, Jesus says, If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Dying in your sins means that you die apart from God because sin separates us from God. It creates a chasm that we cannot bridge on our own. You cannot close that gap through enough good works, enough prayer, enough church attendance, uh, enough Christmas carols, uh, enough good deeds. You can't, you can't do enough to bridge that gap. That gap only gets closed by believing in Jesus and what he did on the cross that what he did on the cross paid the price that sin demanded. Sin demanded a wage of death. And death was paid on the cross. 
And all you have to do is believe that that's what Jesus came to do and that he did that for you. You believe that, all that is left in the ABCs is to confess it. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So we see it's the confession of our mouth because of what we believe in our heart. What we believe in our heart has to come first. You have to believe it before you can say it. If you don't believe it, saying it does you no good. So believing it and confessing it, and that can be as simple as a prayer to God. That's not a, it doesn't have to be a public confession. Um, it just is a confession between you and God. And it can be as simple as this. God, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that sin separates me from you. And I'm so thankful that you sent Jesus into the world, not just to be the baby in a manger, but so that he could take care of the problem, the sin problem that separated me from you. I believe when he died on the cross, he died in my place and for my sins. And I receive the gift of eternal life that is mine by placing my faith in him today. That's it. It doesn't have to be those exact words, but it can be. And I invite you, man, what better time to come to faith and belief in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and to secure your eternity in heaven than Christmas. What better Christmas gift could you give yourself than to do that? And man, I pray that you would do that today because the bottom line is you and I are going to live on past this life and you're going to spend eternity in one of two places, either in hell apart from God or in his presence, enjoying him forever. And that is why he came. He came for that reason. Uh, there's some things I want to share with you guys as we get rolling that I think are just special to me. And um, the, the one I just, I shared it um, from like three years ago. I may have even read it in a video or so last year, but um, in the, uh, the Ransomed Heart newsletter from John Eldridge and his team, uh, I should have refilled that before I started, before I sat down here. Um, uh, from, from 2019, he had this to say in his newsletter. All I want to do today is to remind you that it worked. The invasion worked. The incarnation worked. The entire plan worked. Jesus came. He overthrew the kingdom of darkness. He rescued you from sin and evil and this mad world. He has restored you to your father. He is healing your humanity. Your future is utterly, utterly secure now and breathtaking. We celebrate our rescue. We celebrate our homecoming. We celebrate the fact that the second coming is just around the corner and he will come just as surely as he did the first time when nobody thought it would happen. Oh, it will happen and soon. The best news in any story ever. And I just, man, that's just, that gets an amen from me just every time I read that. It's just so, so good and so profound. Um, and so to kind of to set the stage from there, I want to read to you what, what for me, when I read it, it's like I had never heard this part of the Christmas story or this, this, this um, explanation of, of something that we read. How, how often do we read things in the Bible and just we've heard them so many times, we just kind of skim by them without kind of diving deep. And it, was, it just illustrates what a deep dive can do. This is out of a book, and I've recommended this before, um, Unlocking the Secrets of the Feasts by Michael Norton. And a really great book. But in the, uh, the chapter on the Passover, this is just, I, I think, super, super cool. And so just um, hang in. I'm going to read this to you, and then we'll get into a, a little more specific study in the, in, in the Word. Norton writes this. Um, Let's take a closer look at the Lamb. A number of years ago, I heard Jimmy DeYoung, an outstanding news commentator and Bible teacher, make a presentation at a Bible, uh, at a Bible prophecy conference. Since it was during the Christmas season, he was teaching about the birth of Jesus in the first chapter of Luke. He reads to us Luke 2, 8 through 12, which says this. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. 
And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. <laughs> Dr. DeYoung then asked the audience a surprising question. Did you ever wonder why this was a sign? This left us all speechless. I had to admit that I had never even questioned it. Why was it a sign? Dr. DeYoung had us turn to the book of Micah. We were all familiar with Micah 5.2, which prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, but many of us were not familiar with Micah 4.8, which prophesied that he would be announced at the Tower of the Flock, which is Migdal Eder. Dr. DeYoung, who lived in Jerusalem for a number of years, told us that Migdal Eder was a two-story tower that had been built in a pasture outside Bethlehem. The remains of the tower had recently been discovered. Dr. DeYoung explained that the shepherds in the field had not all been the lowly shepherds we had always assumed. They were actually priests from the temple who were doing shepherding work to assist in the birthing of the sacrificial lambs so that they would be unblemished for sacrifice. While the shepherds were keeping watch over the flock from the top floor of the tower, the shepherd priests would bring the pregnant sheep in from the field to the tower's bottom floor, where the sheep would give birth. As soon as a lamb was born, the priests would wrap it with strips of cloths made from old priestly garments, uh, undergarments, rather. This was done to keep the lamb from getting blemished. The priests would then place the lamb onto a manger to make sure it would not get trampled. <laughs> wow. So when these shepherd priests went to Bethlehem and saw the baby Jesus wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, they must have exclaimed, there is the Lamb of God prepared for sacrifice, unblemished. Whew. I get chills when I read it. Um, they had to be excited beyond description because they were the only ones who could have understood the sign. It was just for them from God. It was personal. Um, pretty, pretty great, um, story. And again, just not, not one uh, growing up in the Western church, certainly that I've ever heard. And, um, I think that there's some, some stuff in, in, in the Christmas story that it just is worth kind of digging out a little bit here. So that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to look at both the, the story in Luke and in Matthew, um, only two of the four Gospels record the Christmas story. Um, Matthew, uh, written primarily to a Jewish audience, and Luke, primary, primarily to a Gentile audience. Uh, Luke um, being a Gentile himself. So, um, likely. Uh, let's see. Let's see the... Um, there, I think it's here in the study note, maybe. Is it the study note? I don't think it's the study note where I looked where I saw that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, in the introduction to Luke in my study Bible, it says, Luke was probably a Gentile by birth, well-educated in Greek culture, a physician by uh, profession, a companion of Paul at various times from his second missionary journey to his first imprisonment in Rome, and a loyal friend who remained with the apostle after others had deserted him. And, and it says, uh, under recipient and purpose, is uh, specifically directed to Theophilus, whose name means one who loves God. Further on, it says, uh, Luke wanted to show that the place of the Gentile Christian in God's kingdom is based on the teaching of Jesus. He wanted to commend the preaching of the gospel to the whole world. So we see kind of a, a, a focus on that. And when we look back at Matthew, um, at the introduction to that, Matthew, it says under recipients, it says this, um, uh, since the gospel was written in, uh, since his gospel was written in Greek, Matthew's readers were obviously Greek speaking. They also seem to have been Jews. Many elements point to Jewish readership. Matthew's concern with fulfillment of the Old Testament, he has more quotations from and allusions to the Old Testament than any other New Testament author, which I find really interesting in itself. 
um, he, you know, his tracing of Jesus' descendants from Abraham, his lack of explanation of Jewish customs, specifically in contrast to Mark, his use of Jewish terminology, uh, like the kingdom of heaven, father in heaven, where heaven reveals the Jewish rever reverential reluctance to use the name of God, his emphasis on Jesus' role as the son of David, etc. It doesn't mean he restricts his gospel to the Jews because he, re re uh, he records the coming of the Magi, which are non-Jews, um, but it's more uh, centered in terms of its, its intended audience and on the Jew. So that kind of sets the stage for where we'll be uh, looking at both of these Gospels. Um, so, um, and again, just for brevity, I, I, I could have probably done three videos on this because yeah, I just think there's some great stuff once you start to drill down. But we're going to look at um, just some things I think are pretty cool here in terms of the, uh, the number three. The number three is something, uh, you know, most people know it as kind of a divine number. Um, I'm just going to read to you briefly from uh, BibleStudy.org about the number three. The number three conveys the meaning of completeness, though to a lesser degree than seven. It appears 467 times in God's word. It derives its symbolism from the fact that it is the first of four spiritually perfect numbers, the others being 7, 10, and 12. Um, then it goes on, um, 27 books in the New Testament, which is three squared, uh, or completeness to the third power. And it goes on uh, about uh, threes in, in prophecy. Next to seven, three is the most commonly referenced number in Revelation. Uh, and it goes on and gives ex examples of that. So, Three, obviously, you know, as, as most folks would, would know, that three is a kind of a significant number. Well, there are multiple threes that just unfold throughout the narrative of the, of the story of Jesus' birth. So we're going to start by looking at those. In Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 1, it says this. It gives the genealogy of, of Jesus, uh, a record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David and the son of Abraham. And don't worry, I'm not going to read the entire genealogy here. Um, but skip, skip that. And then it goes, gives, you know, Abraham the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and so on. Skip to uh, verse 17. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. So three sets of 14 that are specifically called out. Um, I find that pretty cool, pretty interesting. Um, we have uh, the angel of the Lord making a, uh, an appearance to someone in a dream three times. Look as, let's look at that. That's also in Matthew. In one chapter, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 20, it says, um, uh, it talks about Joseph being reluctant to uh, take take Mary home to be his wife. And um, and then it says in verse 20, but after he considered this, because he's considering divorcing her privately so that she's not publicly shamed, most likely stoned to death. It says, after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So there's, there's one instance. The next time is in um, chapter 2 of Matthew, verse 13. It says this. Um, uh, when they had gone, after the, um, after the Magi have come and gone, in 13 it says, when they, had, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And then again, in 19, uh, it says, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So three instances of Joseph appearing, and it, I, I said to someone, but it's someone specific, it's to, uh, to Joseph. Joseph gets three dreams and, um, uh, that are recorded for us in Matthew. 
And then we have three times that the angel, an angel of the Lord uh, that appears in person to someone who's awake. So let's look at those. In Luke chapter 1, verse 11, we get the first one. Uh, and this is, um, we'll, we'll start in uh, verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. So there's, there's one appearance. And we're, again, just for brevity, I'm not going to read the whole, the whole account. Um, but please op open your Bible and go read those yourself. Um, and then we have an appearance to Mary in Luke 126. Very familiar. Um, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of, J of uh, a descendant of David. Um, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, "Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you." So here again, we have a personal appearance of an angel to a person. The third account would be in uh, 2.19. Um, that, that was one. I might have said two. That was one, uh, 128, I think. Yeah, 128. I think I said 26. And then 2.19, uh, which is what we had uh, just read a little bit ago, the angel appearing to the shepherds. Um, there were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. So three instances of an angel appearing in person. And then we go back to, um, to Luke 1, uh, 56. So my book, just flipping a page back. And we have um, three months that Mary st uh, stays with Elizabeth. Um, we know that um, Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. Mary goes to visit her in the sixth month, and it says in verse 56, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. So there's another three. Uh, then we have, this is like not real um, uh, real obvious. Um, I just saw this in the study Bible note. Uh, if you look at Luke 2.14, and the story of the birth of Jesus, is that right? Uh, no, I'm sorry, 2-4. Sorry, 2-4, uh, it says, So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. In my study Bible note, it says this, uh, Bethlehem, the town where David was born, was at least a three-day trip from Nazareth. So you've got another three here, three-day trip. Um, and of course, you've got uh, the Magi who come and visit, and they offer gold and frankincense and myrrh. So I think that's where we get these, this idea that there were three of them because there are three gifts. Uh, we're not told a specific number uh, that are in that, that group, but we are told that they, have th they bear three gifts. And then we have three songs, um, sometimes called songs. Sometimes they would be, be just like testimonies of... Um, that, that appear. And so um, one of them, yeah, here we go. No, that's not that one. That one, oh yeah, yeah, back up a page, Todd. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, uh, we have uh, Mary's song, and we have um, Zechariah's song, and we have uh, Simeon's song. So we're going to look at um, Mary's song. Uh, after the angel, um, or after after Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and um, uh, Mary greets Elizabeth, the child in you know John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy, and um, and she communicates that to Mary, and she says, uh, "Blessed is she who believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished." 
and then we are it's recorded um the subheading says mary's song uh but it just says and mary said and then it goes on and and lists that out again for brevity just gonna um point you to that that would be luke 1 46 through 55 and then we have zechariah's song um we have the birth of john the baptist uh what happens and everyone um let's see da, 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 da. yeah so if you recall in the story uh zechariah did not believe the angel when the angel came and told him that you're going to have a son um he just he says how can this be i'm old my wife's old this this isn't going to work and <laughs> i i just i get a kick out of this when i read it um We'll just look at this real, real quick. Luke one eighteen. Zechariah asked the angel, "How can I be sure of this? Uh, I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years." The angel answered, "I am Gabriel." <laughs> and I just think, man, like you know, you're in trouble if the first thing is like, "Dude," you can almost hear the "dude" like implied <laughs> in the original language. I think, "Dude, I am a, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God." It's like, uh oh. <laughs> Um, I just think Zechariah had to be like, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. And so he's, he's like, can't talk until the child is born, until, until the prophecy that is spoken of transpires. Um, and, um, it, it, and again, it is, it is a prophecy because, uh, you know, the angel says, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. So, you know, it's a little insight, too, into how prophecy is, right? Um, prophecy is not random. Prophecy is not just kind of like on a whim of God. It has an appointed time, a time when it will come to pass. And so for all the prophecies about the end of all things, they will come to pass, and there is an appointed time for them. Um, and they are not random, and they are not according to the whim of God, they are according to his appointed time. And so there was a time when this would take place and that was the prophecy. And so the child is born and um, they ask the mother, uh, you know, that it says on the eighth day in Luke 1, 59, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, his name is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was, was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. And then it's recorded for us in 67. Um, his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, and then he goes on from 68 through 79 to go and speak about, um, uh, it, it would be Zechariah's song. And, um, and it even, even recognizing that he comes, um, uh, as said through the prophets long ago. So, um, then we have Simeon's song which uh, when Jesus is presented on the eighth day, interesting, both of these things happen on the eighth day. Kind of interesting. I just now, just now caught that. Both Zechariah's song and um, Simeon's song. So, you know, Simeon is, um, it, I'll just back up here and read it just for context. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So waiting for the consolation of Israel. I mean, here's, I was going to do this whole section about like, who did these signs appear to? Uh, signs appeared to shepherds. They appeared to righteous people. They appeared to doubting people. Um, but like in Simeon there, he, he's, a, he's um, engaged in religious um, service as part of what he does. He's part of the priestly service. So, but um it, but the fact that it says he's waiting on the consolation of Israel is an indicator that he has he he has knowledge of the prophecies of Messiah and that Messiah is going to come and going to establish Israel and going to be Lord over Israel and that Israel's is going to be you know set up what we now know um, is going to happen at the end of the day of the Lord that seven year period 
um, uh, Simeon knows and is expecting. And that's why, you know, we, we, it's often talked about that, you know, the Jews of the time didn't see Jesus as Messiah because they couldn't get their head around a, a Messiah that was going to die. Um, the, because that was not that was not what they had in mind. The, the, the Messiah comes and reigns and rules over uh, Israel for eternity. So anyway, so he's waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him, picking up in verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. So again, prophecy. Uh, again, prophecy um, in terms of what like, spoken by the angel here, revealed by the Holy Spirit, that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, which was his circumcision, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. And then it's, I'll just read you his, because this is really pretty cool. Um, and there's some stuff in here that's just, I don't think we spend a whole lot of time on this in the Christmas story, because, you know, Jesus is eight days old. And we, we again, we keep Jesus in the manger at <laughs> Christmas, right? Um, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight for all, or in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. So, right there in Simeon's song, we have salvation for the Gentiles prophesied. Love that, love that as a Gentile, right? Um, really, really cool. Um, what he speaks is really, um, it, then it goes on. It's, um, <laughs> it says the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Can you imagine, like, you have brought your child, eight days old, to be circumcised, and there's this great prophecy spoken of by, by the temple priest, and you're, like, taking it all in and marveling, and then he closes it out with, like, a soul will, will pierce your soul, or a sword. A sword will, will pierce your soul. I'm like, she's got to be like, wait, what? Uh, what's that about? Um, again, pointing to even in like the prophecy spoken at his cru at, at, at his circumcision, pointing toward the cross, all things point to the cross. Um, that is what's like so abundantly clear to me here. Um, just as, you know, as, as we read out, out of the book, you know, that the, the lamb wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger pointed to the sacrificial lamb. It, that, that which points then back to Jesus as our sacrificial lamb on Passover being crucified on the very day. So very interesting, I think. So, um, so you've got that prophecy. So there's, um, there's your three songs, Mary's song, Zechariah's song, and Simeon's song. And the last you have three dreams of warning. Um, two of them, and, and I threw this in just because I find it um, pretty interesting, um, you've got uh, three that are, let's see, let's go to, to Luke uh, 2.13, page back here, and the story of the Magi. It says this, um, 2.13, getting the right page. Ah, still not on the right page. There we go. No, nope, that's Luke 1. What in the world? Where's Luke 2 hiding? <laughs> there it is. Um, did I write that down wrong? I, I might have written that down wrong. Sorry, y'all. Um, because that is not 213. Ah, could it be? Could it be? That instead, it is Matthew 2.13. Yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> okay, let's look at Matthew 2.13. So uh, the Magi are there, um, and um, they go and they bring their gifts. Um, 
And then it says, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So there's a, a dream of warning concerning, uh, concerning uh, Jesus. And if you are a uh, James Taylor fan um, and you've not heard it, uh, look up a song called, I think it's called Home by Another Way. But there's a reference to, uh, to this, this warning um, in the... Uh, in, 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 I think it's the first verse, but great James Taylor song if you're a JT fan. So um, so there's there's one. The other one we see uh, to... Um, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so here we have um, another warning in a dream. So again, this is not like um, the angel of the Lord appearing in a dream as he did before, but this is to Joseph as well. So it's it's in that return to Nazareth. It says this, um, right after he's warned, uh, told um, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, get up, take the child, return to Israel. Verse 21, so he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. So separate t separate thing, but a warning. Not told that it's the angel of the Lord here. We're just told, as we were told um, uh, with the Magi, that the, he was warned in a dream. The third warning that comes in a dream, I find, um, let's look at Matthew tw uh, 27. It's, it's really not connected to the Christmas story, but it is in as much as when you understand the story of Christmas is the story of Jesus coming into the world, not to stay in the manger, but to go to the cross. Um, it makes a whole lot more sense. Um, you have this in 27 verse 19, Jesus has been before Pilate. It says, when Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent to him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. So she has a warning about Jesus connected to his crucifixion, warning Pilate because she's been she's been warned in a dream not to have anything to do with him. So that's all of our threes that that I found. Um, really, really interesting. I think um, just a lot of lot of great stuff in there. And again, we could go into all of the all of the things about you know I, I was starting to look at connections between the way signs that we've seen here um, recently, in past, especially in the past couple of years, that there are certainly some parallels to some of the signs as they appeared, um, you know, and, and some of the conditions of the world at the time. Um, and I'm not going to get in, into too much of the weeds, but what really kind of started me down that path was seeing these um, reports of these sheep initially that were walking around in circles. Uh, you know, a few weeks back. And then you started seeing this happening with other animals. And I just saw something like on the 13th that it was with, with another group of animals. And then like five days ago, there was like birds that were all flying in a circle together. And so um, these things continue. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Like if you're not watching the animals, then you probably don't see these things. Um, but because of, you know, the internet, the people that watch the animals can post it. And I thought, well, you know, the, the sign appeared to the, the people who were watching the animals at Jesus's first coming. So, you know, maybe there's some connections. So I started to go down that road and there, I think you could still build out some really interesting stuff there. But, um, again, just to keep us on track, because now we're getting into some stuff that I think is really, really super fascinating. Um, and, and I'm looking at this as kind of like hidden prophecies of Christmas, and so there's two specific prophecies that I want to look at that um, I, I think to me are, are kind of mind-blowing. And you kind of have to kind of dig, again, with all of this, you kind of have to dig a little deeper. But um, they're listed in the Christmas story, but they have connection to Jesus' Jesus's ultimate role, um, even in the day of the Lord, which most people understand to be like the seven-year tribulation. I'm trying to shy away from that because I think the word tribulation has created some confusion um, in terms of how other passages are interpreted. Um, but we are, the, the day of the Lord is a concept that the Jews of the time were certainly familiar, familiar with. 
Um, if you go into my channel on my channel's page and look under playlists, you'll see a Revelation 6 playlist, which kind of unpacks my understanding and interpretation of end times events. And within that, there's a handful of videos. I think it's almost 12 hours or so of video about the day of the Lord and how it's all through the Bible. And the day of the Lord is, is God unleashing his judgment on those who have chosen to reject him. And so that is a real thing. And again, that has an appointed time. That will come. And if you are a believer in Jesus, you're not here for that because the rapture takes place then and we're removed. The day of the Lord is kind of a twofold thing. It's, it's uh, the removal of the righteous and it's, the, uh, it's a separation. It's a separation of the righteous for reward and it's a separation of the unrighteous for wrath. <clears throat> and the wrath of God is poured out over a period of seven years. So that's, that is what you know, when, when you're offered the gift of eternal life, you're offered an escape from that. Um, it's not only <laughs> like your get out of hell free card, it's a get out of the day of the Lord free card. And you don't want to be here. You certainly don't want to spend an eternity in hell, but you don't want to be here for the day of the Lord anyway. So, but there are connections to that in here that are just really fascinating. So we're going to look again here at the story of the Magi uh, in Matthew 2. And it says, um, um, we're just going to look at this. And again, um, Matthew, as you read through, it, it, it does. There, there are multiple times um, when, um, oh, that's a bad sound. It's out of T. That's an out of T sound, my friend. Um, there's multiple times where Matthew says, this happened to fulfill what was written, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's there's definite, we, we talked about this, how Matthew references specific prophecies. And so it says this in the, uh, the story of the Magi. Um, we just start here at the beginning of chapter two. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So this word doesn't just come to Herod, it gets around and all of Jerusalem is disturbed. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. So um, that is, a, that is a, an old, a reference to an Old Testament prophecy that we're going to look at here. And that prophecy is in Micah, as we talked about earlier. Uh, we're going to look at Micah chapter 4. Verse 2, uh, starting in verse 2. Micah, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Micah, not Micah 4, Micah 5. Is that right? Yes, sorry. Micah chapter 5. I have that wrong in my note. Micah 5, 2. And 5, 2 says this. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Looking at verse 4, it says, He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. So there's your prophecy that's quoted. Um, but, but, <laughs> did you see what I did there? Um, I did exactly what the teachers of the law and the chief priests did. They skipped a verse. And when you see what the verse is and what it points to, you'll understand why they skipped it. Verse 3. So we'll, 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 read, we'll read, we'll start with verse 2, and then we'll include verse 3. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you 
will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. Do you understand? Do you understand what he's, what, what they omitted? They omitted a prophecy about Israel being abandoned, God's program for the Israelites being paused so that the rest of his brothers can return to join them. It, and, and, it, it, you know, your ears probably perked up when it says, when she who is in labor gives birth, right? If you look at Revelation chapter 12, and the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a, tw a crown of 12 stars on her head, crying out in pain as if to give birth, right? She was about to give birth, it says. So there's your woman in labor. This is a direct this prophecy points directly to now what we know in the New Testament. They could not have known then because it wasn't written, but that points to the prophecy of the birth of the male child, which I believe to be the church. Um, it is a prophecy of the rapture, even here in the prophecies relative to the coming of Jesus and his birth. Um, and, and so here's like, as we go on, if you've been with me through the study of the day of the Lord, you know that one of the signal words that they're talking about the day of the Lord in the Old Testament, the, the vast majority of the time is where you see the phrase, in that day. So in that day, um, you will see, um, it, let's just set the context, right? Let's set the context for this whole thing. Chapter five again. We don't have chapter breaks in the original in the original manuscripts. There, that's been inserted for us. Subheadings aren't there. That's inserted for us. Verse numbers aren't there. Um, again, all inserted for us so that we can understand it, read it, and study it. But verse four actually sets the context for, or chapter four of Micah actually sets the context for chapter five, and chapter four starts with in the last days. And then it goes on and um, and talks about uh, um, the mountain of the Lord will be established, etc. Uh, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established chief among the mountains. And it goes on and on and on. But then it goes on, it picks up in, in verse 6, in that day, declares the Lord. And then it goes on. And, and, and um, it says... Uh, as for you, a watchtower of the flock, O stronghold of the daughter of Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Um, interesting, there's a connection to the watchtower of the flock and the daughter of, of Zion, and then kingship coming. Um, again, what we read about the watchtower of the flock, um, where, the, where the angels appeared to these shepherds. Fascinating, fascinating business. Um, why do you now cry aloud? We, you, um, uh, have you no king? Has your counselor perished? That pain seizes you like that of a woman in labor. Writhe in agony, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in labor. Um, so again, that's all leading up to this prophecy about, um, about Messiah being born in Bethlehem. And then even after that, further in chapter four, uh, five and verse ten it says, "In that day declares the Lord." So this is um, you know the final messianic reign of Christ. This is like day of the Lord stuff. Um, I will destroy your horses from among you. Uh, verse eleven. I will destroy the cities of your land and tear down all your strongholds. I will destroy your witchcraft so that you will no longer cast spells. I will destroy your carved images and your sacred stones from among you. Um, continuing in fourteen, I will uproot you from among your Asherah uh, from you. I will, remove, ah, I will uproot from among you your Asherah poles. Look at verse 15. I will take vengeance and anger and wrath upon the nations that have not obeyed me. There's a day of the Lord prophecy. This is all contextualized within the day of the Lord. And the, the very passage that they that the, the, the teachers of the law and um, the chief priests quote to Herod 
about where the Messiah will be born comes from within this context. And they intentionally leave out the verse that points to that context. Um, very interesting and a very interesting way to obscure that this Messiah is going to usher in a time when God's plan for Israel is paused. Um, and, you know, more than paused, you know, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth. So very, very fascinating there. Um, and now we're going to wrap up with one that I think is just really cool. I, I saw, uh, I heard rather, I guess I saw, there was a video, uh, Jonathan Kahn give, uh, do a, 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 um, a short video about this. And I was like, huh, never heard that. Very cool. And as I dug in, I was like, well, okay, I didn't read my study Bible note because there's something about that here. Um, we're going to look at Matthew chapter two. Um, I just find this really, 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 really cool. So we're going to look at this, this prophecy that Matthew makes reference to, and we're going to unpack it in a way that I, I, I find really, really fascinating. I don't know how many times I can say that. Maybe if I say it enough, it'll, I'll communicate how fascinated I am by it. Um, so th this is uh, after, uh, we'll just pick up here. Uh, so he got up and uh, this is Joseph, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father, uh, in the place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he, re he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. You know what's fascinating here? Is there is not a prophecy in the Old Testament that says he will be a Nazarene. There's not. Um... This is what kind of caught my eye about Jonathan Kahn's video because he unpacked this. And um, what I find is that um, there, there's um, some scholarly agreement about this, more so than I would have expected. Um, so um, the notes in the study Bible even says, um, these exact words are not found in the Old Testament and probably refer to several Old Testament prefigure, uh, prefigurations and or predictions. Uh, note the plural, prophets. Other, other places he says, so was fulfilled, or so was fulfilled uh, what was said through the prophet. This he says, um, uh, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, plural. So indicating more than one. And it says here, for in Jesus's day, Nazarene was virtually a synonym for despised. Some hold that in speaking of Jesus as a Nazarene, Matthew is referring primarily to the word branch. The Hebrew is the word netzer, as seen in Isaiah 11.1. 1. So we're going to look at that. But before we do that, I'm going to go to commentary. There's a couple of commentaries I could have picked from. I thought this kind of summed things up really, really well. Um, Ellicott's commentary for English readers says this. He shall be called a Nazarene. For an account, and then it says this about that. Uh, for an account of Nazareth, see note on Luke one twenty six. Here it will be enough to deal with Saint Matthew's reference to the name, as in itself the fulfillment of a prophetic thought. He does not, as before, cite the words of any one prophet by name, but says generally that what he quotes had been spoken of by or through the prophets. No such words are to be found in the Old Testament. It is not likely that the evangelist would have quoted from any apocryphal prophecy, nor is there any trace of the existence of such a prophecy. <clears throat> uh, the true explanation is to be found in the impression made on his mind by the verbal coincidence of fact with prediction. He had heard men speak with scorn of the Nazarene, and yet the very syllables of that word had also fallen on his ears in one of the most glorious of prophecies admitted to be messianic. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a netzer, or branch, shall grow out of his roots. 
Isaiah 11.1. 1. So, let's just go to Isaiah 11.1. 1, and we'll look at that. And we'll read that right here. Isaiah 11. It says, uh, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And so, um, it says, it continues on. Um, so he found in the word of scorn, the, uh, the name of glory, uh, nomen et omen, like a prophetic name, I guess is what that would be. I am not like, that looks Latin. <laughs> My Latin's a little rusty. Um, <laughs> the town of Nazareth probably took its name from this meaning of the word as pointing uh, to the trees and shrubs for which it was conspicuous. So, and actually, that is actually true. If you look at the uh, the etymology of the word um, Nazareth um, from uh, abrahimpublications.com, it says uh, the meaning of Nazareth is watchtower. Interesting again, right? Um, or branches, uh, consecrated place of Nazarite scattering or diaspora. But the second word there is branches. And the etymology, the first thing it says for, uh, from etymology is uh, from the verb nasar to protect or preserve, or the noun netzer, branch or shoot. So that is, um, so that's when, when Ellicott is speaking of this, um, uh, this word for Nazareth, taking its name from the meaning of the word. Um, the town of Nazareth does take its, its name from that says, the general reference to the prophets is explained by the fact that the same thought is expressed, and he lists these others. Um, though the Hebrew word is zamak, not netzer, but it's still the train of thought is the language. And so we're going to look at these. So in addition to Isaiah 11.1, 1, um, which is the Messianic prophecy we read a moment ago, we're going to look at um, Jeremiah 23. 23, verse 5, says this, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. Uh, this is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. So clearly a reference um, a, uh, to, to Messiah and specifically to Jesus uh, look at Jeremiah 33, Jeremiah 33, verse 15, says this, um, um, In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteousness. So very similar uh, language there. Um, and then we're going to look at Zechariah 3, 8. I did not have all of these. Zechariah, there we go. Did not have all of these marked because there's a whole lot. Uh, Zechariah 3, 8 says this. Um, a listen, O high priest, Joshua and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. Um, branch there is capitalized actually in my Bible. So very interesting, uh, personifying it there. And then in Zechariah 6, verse 12, it says this. Um, I will start in, uh, it says, tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch. And he will branch out from the, from his place and build the temple of the Lord. And it goes on and on and on. Um, he will be a priest on his throne uh, in verse 13. Um, so there we have these, um, these prophecies that I think just really, 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 really fascinating stuff um, about the branch. And about that being the connection, that being what's, uh, what's being referred to here in Matthew. So, but I want to 
I want to go back. That in itself is fascinating because that's like the, these, um, this kind of hidden prophecy of him as Messiah, as Jesus as Messiah, and where we get that Nazarene connection that Matthew speaks about. But it goes deeper than that. Specifically, in uh, in one in one part, I want to look at. Let's go back to Isaiah eleven, okay? Because that's where it gets um, it takes a, a, an interesting turn. So again, the primary thing that would have been on his mind, like like in terms of like the messianic ones that they list, that and that netzer, the word netzer directly points to. Um, is Isaiah 11.1. 1. We'll read that again. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Um, and, and again, it, it goes on. You know, the, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Um, but uh, this is, you know, there's there's all kinds of, this goes on and on and on. Um, with messianic kind of look, you know, this is where you get the wolf lying down with the lamb, um, the, the infant playing near the hole of a cobra, blah, blah, blah. But it takes a really weird and interesting kind of turn here. In chapter 10, or in verse 10, it says this, in that day, so in that day, now we know that's, they were signaling, that's kind of pointing, especially in Isaiah, Isaiah uses in that day a lot to point to that final seven years, that day of the Lord period. It says this, in that day, the root of Jesse, which we've looked at here in verse 11, one, that's the root is um, is Jesus. The roots of, a uh, from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Uh, the root of Jesse, which is Jesus, will stand as a banner for the peoples. Uh, the nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. Um, in that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant of Israel. Um, so again, so we've got a, a, a picture of the final um, uh, restoration of Israel there, but we have the root is now also the branch. I'm sorry, uh, the, yeah, the branch is now also the banner. So that is, in itself is what I want to look at because if if the prophecy is pointing people uh, of, of that time that would have heard that and go, oh yeah, I know what he means here by Nazarene. He's pointing to this prophecy of, of Messiah being the branch. Um, they would have also made this connection, I believe. Um, the, the word um, for banner is Strong's 5251. Uh, the Hebrew 5251, not the Greek, but the Hebrew 5251. And its uh, its definition is a standard, an ensign, signal, or sign. And we're going to look at some places where it's used. So again, Jesus, since Jesus is the, um, uh, the branch, the root of Jesse, he is also the banner according to Isaiah 11.10. So let's look at where this word is used. I find Really, 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 really fascinating here. Um, we're going to look at Numbers. The book of Numbers. It says this um, in Numbers uh, 21, verse 8. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. When anyone who was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. So you've got this strange, weird thing that, that Moses is told to do. I think probably oh, most folks read that and they're like, what? Um, but the word pole there is uh, uh, the word banner. It's ensign. Uh, if we look at that, uh, if you look at the, etymol or the, the inner linear of that, uh, the pole is 5251. That's the same word. And Jesus himself makes a really cool connection to this. Um, he makes the connection himself to this, where he says in John 3, just uh, in verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, 
that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So, just as in the time of Moses, the people were just to look. It wasn't like a great ritual they had to perform. If anyone who was bitten by a snake looked at the bronze snake on the pole, uh, on, on this banner, then they lived. And Jesus is saying, um, everyone who believes may have eternal life. If just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, meaning on the cross, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. That leads right into, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Come on. Um, the connection that we see this prophecy, this Nazarene prophecy in Matthew that has no specific place. If you follow the breadcrumbs, it leads you to this word for that's used for pole here, which then Jesus says, just like that pole is going to be my cross. You looked to that to be saved. Now you look to my cross to be saved. Mind-blowing, mind-blowing stuff. Um, We'll look at Isaiah. We'll, we're going to uh, camp out here in Isaiah for just a short bit. We'll look at 13, um, verse 2, for another place where this banner is used. Um, Isaiah 13, 2 says this. Um, this is prophecy against Babylon. It's the subheading. It says, raise a banner on a hilltop. Shout to them, beckon to them to enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my holy ones. I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath. Um, those who rejoice in my triumph. Listen, a voice on the mountains like that of a great multitude. It goes on. Um, but we've looked a, a lot at Isaiah 13 because it is a full-on, full-contact, kung fu grip, day of the Lord passage. Um, but it begins, you know, we've looked at it where it says um, in verse 6, wail for the day of the Lord is near. Uh, it will come like destruction from the Almighty. Uh, verse 6, terror will seize them, pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. Again, this connection of a, a woman in labor is, is a direct connection to the day of the Lord over and over and over again. Um, See, a day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. We've got, you know, the, the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, the stars of heaven and the constellations not showing their light, all all in sixth seal kind of verbiage. Uh, this verse that we've talked about a great deal, I will make man scarcer than pure gold, more gold than the gold of Ophir. That's all here. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place. Sixth seal. Um, but starting with, raise a banner on a bare, bare hilltop. Jesus is the banner. Jesus is connected with this day of the Lord thing. We're going to see that again here. Let's look at Isaiah 18. This whole um, Isaiah 13 through whatever it is, 24, I think, um, passage of uh, that we, we, we really broke down uh, a couple of different times. In 18, verse 3, it says this. This is a prophecy against Cush. <clears throat> it says, All you people of the world, all you who live on the earth. So it's not just Cush. Now it's everybody. When a banner is raised on the mountains, you will see it. And when a trumpet sounds, you will hear it. So geez, everyone, every eye will see Jesus when he, when the banner, when the trumpet sounds, and when Jesus comes to reclaim his bride, all will see it. Now, those that are left, they're given a great delusion say that, so that they don't believe whatever that story is. And who are left, as we've talked about before, is far, far fewer than anyone would care to, to imagine. Um, but again, that's the Jesus being the banner and it's all you people of the world, you who live on the earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains, you will see it. And when a trumpet sounds, you will hear it. And it goes on to talk about the, uh, the harvest. Um, you go and, and, and read that, that, that whole, um, passage is really fascinating. So there, but there you've got a, a distinct connection between the banner and, and the trumpet which we know the trumpet sounds and Christ descends and um, we who are alive and remain are caught up with those who have been resurrected. So uh, we'll look at Isaiah 49. We're almost done. We're going to wrap up here in just a few minutes. Um, Isaiah 49, 
We're going to look at two things for six. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Isaiah 49. Oh, I'm sorry. I was skipping ahead. 49, verse 22. This is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon to the Gentiles. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. Again, it's a connection of Jesus is the banner being lifted up to the peoples and specifically beckoning to the Gentiles. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their shoulders. Speaking to the Jews, the Gentiles are going to do this into the kingdom. Um, fascinating business, man. Again, you could unpack that in, the, in eight ways from Sunday and just have some really interesting stuff there. But again, just to keep things rolling, we're going to look at um, where we're going to where we're going to finish this up um, in Jeremiah chapter four. Um, you've got uh, we're going to look at two verses, uh, verse six. Um, it says this in chap uh, Jeremiah four six. Raise the signal. That signal is the same word for banner. Um, to go to Zion, flee for safety without delay, for I am bringing disaster from the north and ter uh, even terrible destruction. Um, a lion has come out of his lair. A destroyer of nations has set out. He has left his place to, way to lay waste your land. So then it says in verse 9, in that day. So again, now, now we know we're talking about this is happening at the day of the Lord. Um, because you've got the signal here, but look look back up at verse 5, where I, I, I should have started there. Announce in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, sound the trumpet throughout the land. Cry aloud and say, gather together. What does that sound like? And then you've got raise a, a signal to go to Zion. This is like, this is um, the signal, again, it's banner. And the context here in verse 9, in that day declares the Lord, the kings and the officials will lose heart and priests will be horrified and the prophets will be appalled. Day of the Lord. And look at what it says next. I found this just like, wait, what, what does that say? Then I said, ah, sovereign Lord, how completely you have deceived this people and Jerusalem by saying you will have peace when the sword is at our throats. That points right to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, I think it's 10, that talks about that God sends a powerful delusion so that they believe the lie. And we've talked about that God's intention for those who are left here is not that they like come to Jesus. Their come to Jesus moment has come and gone. His intention is for them to believe the lie of the Antichrist, of the man of lawlessness spoken about in Second Thessalonians 2. That's God. And if God wants you to believe a lie, guess what? You're going to believe the lie. If he wants you deceived, you will be deceived. Interesting here that we're talking about the banner, which is Jesus, the trumpet sound, and this gathered together, which is a clear picture of the rapture, all within the context of in that day in verse 9. We have right on the heels of that, um, how completely you have deceived your people and Jerusalem. Um, crazy, crazy. So we're going to look um, also in that same chapter. You know, 19, oh, my anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart, my heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent, for I have heard the sound of the trumpet. I have heard the battle cry. Um, disaster follows disaster. That's like revelation, man. Um, the whole land lies in ruins. In an instant, my tents are destroyed, my shelter in a moment. How long must I see the battle standard, which is Jesus? and hear the sound of the trumpet. Um, skip on to 24. Again, we're at context of the day of the Lord, and we've got six seal references here. Um, uh, it, it's 23. I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty at the heavens, and the light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking, and the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. Um, I looked and the fruitful land was a desert and all its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. 
Therefore, in verse 28, the earth will mourn and the heavens grow dark. The earth mourning, um, we know that when the when Zechariah is, what, 10? 10, I think, when um, the Jews finally do have their eyes open to Jesus as the one that they had been longing for all along, that they mourn as one mourns for uh, an only child. Um, because I have spoken and will not relent, I have decided and will not turn back. And I'm just going to throw this in because in terms of prophetically looking at what's going on here uh, to Jerusalem and their deception and the battle cry and the rapture and all of this stuff, we even get pictures of of Jerusalem as um, the harlot in, uh, in Revelation 17. Look at what it says in verse 30. What are you doing, O devastated one, which is, which is Jerusalem here, which is Israel? Why dress yourself in scarlet and put on jewels of gold? Why shade your eyes with paint? You adorn yourself in vain. Your lovers despise you. They seek your life. And that is right out of Revelation 17, 21. That, uh, let's just look at that real fast. Revelation 17, 21 is, um, it says, uh, talking about the, the prostitute who sits so many waters. Um, it says, oh, there is no 1721. Man, I write these things down wrong <laughs> in trying to get this. Um, I didn't mean 21. Um, I meant, uh, yeah, 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 sorry. Not 1721, 1716. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and will leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. That's like, that's what it says here. Um, that your lovers will despise you. They seek your life. And how does this chapter, this Jeremiah 4, wind up? I hear a cry as of a woman in labor, as a groan of, a one, of, of one bearing her first child. The cry of the daughter of Zion, gasping for breath, stretching out her hands and saying, alas, I am fading. My life is given over to murderers. Um, so much prophetically, but all, like if you follow the breadcrumbs, all traced back to Jesus being the banner, which we we're told in Isaiah 11, uh, 10, that just, he's the banner and he's also the branch. And you go back from that and you have branch being connected to this prophecy in Matthew about Jesus being the prophets saying that he would be a Nazarene. He would be the branch. Um, it is inescapable that the ultimate role that Jesus would play would be his role in the day of the Lord and the judgment of the people who have rejected him and the, the gathering of his people to him who have believed in him. All of that tied up in these hidden prophecies of his birth. So as you move into your celebration of Christmas, just know that um, there is an appointed time for all of the things that for those of us who are watching for the return of Christ, there's an appointed time for all of that. It's going to happen. You will not see me posting charts and business like that just because that's not the way that I watch. Um, and I'm not knocking anyone that does, but I just, our, our success rate on that has been, you have to admit, it's been pretty bad. Um, every chart so far has failed <laughs> in terms of predicting when the rapture is going to happen. Um, but it is show enough going to happen. And what's left for those who are left behind, what's waiting for them is horrific business, my friends. And it's not something anybody wants to be here to be a part of. Um, I want to leave you with just something that um, I want to read for you out of a great book that I got many, many years ago, uh, actually at a Young Life camp in their bookstore. Uh, my introduction to Max Licato is an author. Uh, God Came Near is the name of the book. And I just wanna read you the first chapter. Um, it's, they're very short. This is only like a couple of pages, like three pages. Um, but it's, it's kind of just relax for a minute, kind of put the prophecy thoughts out of your head for a moment and just like, let's, let's just set our, our mind on, on the season here. This is called The Arrival. The noise and the bustle began earlier than usual in the village. As night gave way to dawn, people were already on the streets. Vendors were positioning themselves on the corners of the most heavily traveled avenues. 
Store owners were unlocking the doors to their shops. Children were awakened by the excited barking of the street dogs and the complaints of donkeys pulling carts. The owner of the inn had awakened earlier than most in the town. After all, the inn was full, all the beds taken. Every available mat or blanket had been put to use. Soon, all the customers would be stirring and there would be a lot of work to be done. One's imagination is kindled, thinking about the conversation of the innkeeper at his family at the breakfast table. Did anyone mention the arrival of the young couple the night before? Did anyone ask about their welfare? Did anyone comment on the pregnancy of the girl on the donkey? Perhaps. Perhaps someone raised the subject, but at best it was raised, not discussed. There was nothing that novel about them. They were possibly one of several families turned away that night. Besides, who had time to talk about them when there was so much excitement in the air? Augustus did the economy of Bethlehem a favor when he decreed that a census should be taken. Who could remember when such commerce had hit the village? No, it was doubtful that anyone mentioned the couple's arrival or wondered about the condition of the girl. They were too busy. The day was upon them. The day's bread had to be made. The morning's chores had to be done. There was too much to do to imagine that the, that the impossible had happened. God had entered the world as a baby. Yet, were, some, were someone to chance upon the sheep stable on the outskirts of Bethlehem that morning, what a peculiar scene they would behold. The stable stinks like all stables do. The stench of urine, dung, and sheep reeks pungently in the air. The ground is hard, the hay scarce. Cobwebs cling to the ceiling and a mouse scurries across the dirt floor. A more lowly place of birth could not exist. Off to one side sit a group of shepherds. They sit silently on the floor, perhaps perplexed, perhaps in awe, no doubt in amazement. Their night watch had been interrupted by an explosion of light from heaven and a symphony of angels. God goes to those who have time to hear him. So on this cloudless night, he went to simple shepherds. Near the young mother sits the weary father. If anyone is dozing, he is. He can't remember the last time he sat down. And now that the excitement has subsided a bit, now that Mary and the baby are comfortable, he leans against the wall of the stable and feels his eyes grow heavy. He still hasn't figured it all out. The mystery of the event puzzles him. He hasn't the energy to wrestle with the question. What's important is that the baby is fine and Mary is safe. A sleep comes. As sleep comes, he remembers the name the angel told him to use. Jesus. We will call him Jesus. Wide awake is Mary. My, how young she looks. Her head rests on the soft leather of Joseph's saddle. The pain has been eclipsed by wonder. She looks into the face of the baby, her son, her Lord, her majesty, his majesty. At this point in history, the human being who best understands who God is and what he is doing is a teenage girl in a smelly stable. She can't take her eyes off him. Somehow, Mary knows she is holding God. So this is he. She remembers the words of the angel. His kingdom will never end. He looks like anything but a king. His face is prunish and red. His cry, though strong and healthy, is still the helpless and piercing cry of a baby. And he is absolutely dependent upon Mary for his well-being. Majesty in the midst of the mundane, holiness in the filth of sheep, manure, and sweat, divinity entering the world on the floor of a stable through the womb of a teenager and in the presence of a carpenter. She touches the face of the infant God. How long was your journey? The baby had over, this baby had overlooked the universe. These rags keeping him warm were the robes of eternity. His golden throne room had been abandoned in favor of a dirty sheep pen, and worshiping angels had been replaced with kind but bewildered shepherds. Meanwhile, the city hums. The merchants are unaware that God has visited their planet. The innkeeper would never believe that he had just sent God out into the cold, and the people would scoff at anyone who told them Messiah lay in the arms of a teenager on the outskirts of their village. They were all too busy to consider the possibility. Those who missed his majesty's arrival that night missed it not because of evil acts or malice. No, they missed it because they simply weren't looking. 
Little has changed in the last 2,000 years, has it? Wow, that was unexpectedly emotional. Um, I pray, man, that that is just a blessing to you as you consider what Christmas is, that it is in the spiritual warfare that we're engaged in all around us. It was an invasion of the highest order. It was God drawing a line in the sand and saying, no, this is the dividing point. This is where things change. God entered our world and salvation is offered as a gift to you and to me if we would just receive it by believing, not in the Jesus in the manger as a baby, but in the Jesus on the cross dying for our sins. Make that decision if you haven't. My friends, I wish nothing but a wonderful, blessed, spectacular Christmas for you and your family. I love you guys. Merry Christmas.